Great. Uh, thank you, Victor, for the introduction, Fiona, for the invitation to speak, and um, everyone for attending today. Um, so I'm going to talk about hydrogen and graphite today. Um, our position in that market is that we're a low-cost, low-emission hydrogen and graphite production technology company. So we're a technology development company developing um, a new way of manufacturing hydrogen that produces a graphite byproduct without producing a carbon emission as part of its process. Uh, we think this is really topical and timely because both hydrogen and graphite are absolute key products in a 21st century economy for the decarbonisation of the energy system, for the decarbonisation of transport, and also for the development of more advanced materials and processes with not a few overlaps with some of the themes that Alex was talking about. We are seeing an emerging premium market for hydrogen from low emission sources. The hydrogen is traditionally created in a, a very CO2 intensive manner, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But we're seeing a growing push from Japan, Korea, the European Union, California, the Pacific Northwest, um, the US uh, Massachusetts area uh, for a low emission transport fuel, which can be a direct replacement for diesel in trains, in trucks, in buses, in forklifts and in heavy transport. We think we're ideally positioned to take advantage of this growing wave, you know, a wave that's become very topical this year with the development of national hydrogen strategies in a number of countries, including in Australia, with the Australian National Hydrogen Strategy due to be delivered by the Chief Scientist at the request of COAG uh, later this month. And we believe that we've identified both a technological innovation and a market innovation which allows us to be the lowest emission technology supplying this new sector. And in terms of sort of recent material and uh, very relevant news, uh, in the last quarter we have received uh, an ARENA grant of $9.41 million to progress the proposed commercial demonstration plan. Um, so first of all, I'll actually talk a, a lot about, or a little bit about, uh, given that I'm the last speaker before lunch, what is the hydrogen economy? Or as the Japanese so you know, charmingly refer to it, the hydrogen society. Um, and there's, uh, I found that you know, as I talk to large fund managers, to sort of research groups from the bulge bracket banks, um, and in fact a, a really well-known journalist this morning and a, a, a tier one fund manager both sort of asked the sort of the question. They hadn't realised that you make hydrogen and you use it in cars as a part of electric transport, not as part of a combustion engine. So it's worth just talking a little bit about why is everyone now so fixated on hydrogen? What does it mean and how does it fit? So very simply, hydrogen actually is what allows you to store, transport and use renewable energy uh, in a multitude of different ways. It enables the large scale integration of renewables into grids or between countries, between regions or between seasons. Because with the rise of lower and lower cost renewable energy, with the dropping in the cost of electrolysis, one of the clean ways of making hydrogen, we can now, through the use of hydrogen as a stored fuel, which can then be transferred back to power, heat, um, or as a transport fuel without any carbon, allows you to take excess renewable energy in certain regions, transform it into something, a molecule that can be transported, and take it to where it's needed. And this is what's really kicked off the huge interest in hydrogen in Australia this year, when Japan, undertaking a multi-year regional study of where their future hydrogen needs will come from, identified Australia as having the best natural resources, the best combination of wind, solar, available land, engineering and process technology, a capable workforce. And so they identified that Australia would be the key to achieving their national objective of 100% replacement of natural gas imports by hydrogen by 2050. And that sounds like a staggering uh, commitment, but it's not dissimilar to the commitment they made in the 80s and 70s to replace heavy fuel oil with gas. And it's not dissimilar to the commitment they made to create an iron ore export industry to supply their steel industry in the 50s. And it's the same ministries and the same government capability that's just as focused on doing this. But hydrogen can also allow you to distribute energy across sectors, regions or seasons. So it could allow you to take excess wind energy from South Australia uh, to Sydney or Melbourne. It could allow you to take wind and solar energy through hydrogen to Japan and Korea from the Pilbara. Um, it could allow you to take you know, hydro from New Zealand you know, across into Melbourne and Sydney. But it also acts as a buffer to increase system resilience. You know, there's a lot of discussion about how are we going to cope with more renewables coming into the grid. And simply the answer actually has often been posited, and it is technically the correct answer, is that it's hydrogen. Because it allows you to take excess energy turn it into uh, storable material, which then converts back to energy and heat without a carbon emission as needed. 
So electrolyzers, hydrogen storage can be used either at the state scale, the nodal scale, or even the building scale to provide system resilience services, frequency control, voltage control. Um, it can allow you to uh, strengthen and stabilize grids without capital investment. And it can allow you to up, you know, to buffer in the swings and roundabouts of demand and renewable production by acting as a buffer. So hydrogen has a massive part to play in how we'll go from getting a 30 to 40 percent penetration of renewables simply by stuffing cheap wind and solar into the into the system. And hydrogen is what allows you to take that up to 60, 70, 80 percent or more by providing that ability to buffer, to swing, and to transform its use. Because, of course, as well as being a form of storage, you know, the, the only form of storage which is capable of replicating the large scale of pumped hydro, um, it's also a product in its own right. So we go from sort of talking about something which is relevant to the Kidston um, uh, uh, proposition to something which then starts to build on some of the themes that Alex talked about. So hydrogen itself can decarbonise transport. It's a direct replacement for diesel and heavy transport. It's a direct replacement in things like trains, trucks and ferries. It can help you decarbonise industrial energy use. So the use of hydrogen to make steel through the DRI process, an electric arc furnace rather than the blast furnace, is the, the, the major objective of European steel makers through their green steel program. Um, it can decarbonise building heat and power through the use of large-scale fuel cells or hydrogen turbines. So today I can buy a turbine that burns 80% hydrogen from GE off the shelf. By next year we should be able to buy a 100% hydrogen turbine from Mitsubishi through which they plan to power the Tokyo Olympic Village. And it also can be a renewable feedstock. You know, hydrogen is the major chemical building block of, uh, of fertilisers, of explosives, um, petrochemicals, semiconductor manufacturing, all of which traditionally comes from a, diluting, from a polluting source. But ourselves offer a technical path which is a non-polluting source. So this is a, a diagram from Alan Finkel's initial review, um, which was released in June, um, and I really recommend there's uh, 14 issue papers. They're only eight to 10 pages long, and they're very clear and concise, but it's a great summary, particularly papers one and two of, of the hydrogen transition. So one of the things that you know, we're building upon here is that there's actually a very large hydrogen in industry already existing, and it's this blue bubble on the right. So there's a hydrogen uh, industry that you don't see because it just is, looks like the front end of the petrochemical industry. And it's the creation of hydrogen along with air separation units making nitrogen and oxygen that allow you to make ammonia, ammonium nitrate, urea, um, explosives. It's also used in metals processing, uh, food processing, and glass manufacturing. So there's a whole big industry out there that's providing us with the tools that we can then integrate our process into. You know, the tools for hydrogen transport, hydrogen storage, uh, metering, detection units, valving, etc. But what's now emerging in the light blue bubble is the clean hydrogen market where there's actually a real emphasis on low emission sources for commercial scale heating and cooling, for electricity generation and for transport. And the opportunity that's made there's such a focus in Australia obviously is the potential to, to move into our next 30 and 40 year export industry through the export of hydrogen to Japan and Korea. So a really quick sort of um, uh, you know, visit on electric vehicles and, and I apologise if this is repeating the obvious but I, I do find over the last 12 months of talking to funds there's probably only about a 50% recognition of the fact that a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle is an electric car and I must admit even when I did my due diligence to take this job and, and I am a chemical engineer by training I probably if I'd been asked and given a 50-50 option I probably would have got it wrong and guessed that it had a spark engine in it but Hydrogen vehicles are part of the electric vehicle transformation. That in a classic electric vehicle, a battery electric vehicle, um, you have a large bank of lithium ion batteries and your electric fuel is stored by charging. And then when you put your foot down on the accelerator, yeah, you pull out that stored electricity, that stored fuel, um, to drive your engine. So in a fuel cell vehicle, you have a hydrogen tank, um, you have a graphite, uh, you have a, a fuel cell stack, a hydrogen fuel cell, which actually includes graphite, which is useful. Um, and then you still have the same electric drive system that you have in a battery car. So in a hydrogen car, it's still an electric car, it's still an electric truck, it's still an electric train, but you make your electricity by pulling on hydrogen, putting it through a fuel cell, so you generate instantaneous electricity on demand. And the only tailpipe emission is water and it's actually clean enough to drink. You know, it's quite a novelty to drink the water out of the tailpipe of a Toyota Mirai at the at sort of a fuel cell and car expos. 
they um they give it away in bottles directly from the tailpipe as a novelty. Yeah, so it is part of the uh, the electrification revolution. And the other thing to to add in the background to hydrogen um, is that this industry is actually remarkably mature. So if I leave one message with fund managers, self managed super managers, private investors, family offices is we're at the very start of a 20 or 30 year growth uh, phase here, the same way we were with wind and solar in 2001 and two. And just like the, the last phase of renewables, there was an enormous amount of work being done under the surface and not visible because something wasn't quite economic. And as soon as it became economic, you saw economies of scale, um, which drove down manufactured prices and suddenly it went from being only just economic to massively economic. And we're starting to see the, the same things in, in the hydrogen industry. Um, it's really going to be transformative, the fact that the hydrogen chain goes from wind and solar through electrolysis or biomass through our process uh, into um, manufactured products. So we can actually create a workable supply chain that fully integrates storage without carbon being involved, without needing at any stage the traditional pieces of the energy industry, a map, a resource, an extractive permit. And I think that's really going to be very, very telling over the next 20 years. So here we actually have um, you know, pretty pictures, but these are all existing commercial vehicles in operation. Um, I particularly like uh, the train story. So that train operates around the city of Frankfurt in Germany. Um, it's made by Alstom, so a tier one you know, European uh, multinational manufacturer. And only in June this year, the federal government of Germany placed an order for an additional 43 trains to replace the uh, to, to build on the initial demonstration fleet, and that was a 530 million euro order. So we're seeing now major commercial or, uh, orders. Um, that is the uh, Hyundai uh, Nexo, fantastic SUV, 800 kilometer range on a 10 kilogram hydrogen tank, um, and that sort of gives you some sort of idea of how capable these vehicles are. Not available in Australia in that formation, unfortunately, but available in Europe, Korea, Japan, and the US. Uh, waste fleets running in Denmark, um, and that is uh, the Toyota fuel cell bus, uh, which operates uh, in the city of Tokyo and, and will be a major supplier to the fleet for the 2020 Olympics. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing a, an availability of both production technologies, storage and intermediate infrastructure technologies and end use technologies. We're seeing the massive availability of low cost renewable energy, which has allowed you know, hydrogen to get to the tipping point of being cost competitive. And we're seeing a way now to start to attack some of the more difficult areas of decarbonisation, transport, heavy industry, um, citywide heating. And this is starting now to come together, again drawing the analogue to where the renewable industry was in the early 2000s, with consistent national programs and uh, incentives and legislation. So Japan has a target for 800,000 fuel cell vehicles and 900 fueling stations by 2030. Uh, Korea has even more aggressive targets. They're looking to have 30% of all vehicles on hydrogen by 2030. Um, and they've placed an order this year for 800 fuel cell buses for their police force. Not surprisingly, both Japanese and Korean companies are leading in the, the automotive manufacturing race to produce sort of the base level models, you know, the standard models of these cars. So they see this as a way of drawing through their next manufacturing industry. Uh, California has a very active fuel cell partnership rolling out um, a combination of infrastructure, leases for vehicles. Um, in Europe, there's uh, uh, government industry partnerships to provide refueling stations um, and infrastructure through France, Denmark and Germany. Um, and there's hydrogen trains as well as a truck fleet operational across a number of these countries. And in Australia, we've been a little bit late to the party, but uh, we have been a little bit hit by the lucky stick again in that we've been identified as you know, the uh, prime country to most get the greatest value from using hydrogen and be best placed to export it. Um, Alan Finkel was uh, charged by COAG last year to develop a national hydrogen strategy based on the, the roadmap that CSIRO had put together in August 2018. And that's due for delivery at the end of this month, early next month. All right, so we'll finally get around to talking about what Hazer is. So um, in the context of, of the hydrogen opportunity, which is a low, um, a low emission uh, opportunity, it's sort of important to understand that at the moment there's broadly two ways of making hydrogen, both of which have their issues. Currently about 95% of the world's hydrogen comes from fossil fuel reforming, steam methane reforming. 
It's a uh, well-established, brutally effective and highly polluting process. And, and in that process, you take natural gas, methane and ethane, um, you run it through a very high temperature furnace, you know, over 1100 degrees, and you heat it uh, in the presence of steam, which stops your pipes melting, um, and you hope that the methane decomposes before your steam pipes melt. Um, but it's a very effective process, but it produces 10 to 12 tonnes of CO2 for every tonne of hydrogen you produce. So it's only really cheap at very large scale, so it doesn't lend itself well to a distributed clean product that needs to get close to customers. And it's really a CO2 generation process that gets hydrogen as a byproduct. You know, there's a 10 or 12 to 1 ratio in mass. So it's, not, it's been clearly identified as not the right solution, you know, unless you could do carbon capture and storage at a global scale. Uh, for the future of the uh, requirements of Japan, Korea and other um, countries who are pushing hydrogen as part of their transition. The alternative in which you're starting to come into its own is electrolysis. So electrolysis, you take water, it has to be purified, um, and you pass you know, a really high amount of energy in the form of electricity through it, it separate, and you separate the water directly into hydrogen and oxygen. So it is a very clean process if it's fully driven by renewables, but it's remarkably energy intensive. So it's traditionally not been cheap, so the price is coming down substantially, making large-scale hydrogen competitive in the next um, you know, few years. But you have a bit of a chicken and egg issue with it, that if you want it small scale, you're connected to the grid, in which case it's no longer clean. If you want it cheap and large scale, you have to go far away from where your customers are to attach it to a standalone wind farm, standalone solar farm which is why we're looking like at areas like Midwestern New South Wales um, or Midwest Northern Australia. So both of them have barriers to growth. What Hazer offers is an alternative production technology that's complementary to the rise of electrolysis, but we think offers um, a better, cheaper, faster, smaller solution, particularly for early adopter markets. So we start with methane. So we have the efficiency of a gas-based process. We have the, you know, that molecule of CH4, four hydrogen atoms and a carbon atom bonded together. Um, in our process, we operate uh, with similar equipment to a steam methane reformer, so we can piggyback off the engineering, the fabrication, the equipment supply. But rather than mixing methane and steam together, um, we actually operate in, a, in an inert environment, an environment which has a blanket of, uh, of nitrogen as needed, and we use an iron ore, a low-cost uh, process catalyst, to facilitate the decomposition of methane into two hydrogen molecules and a solid carbon. So this is sort of the, the key here, is that the gas goes in and the gas in a solid comes out. It's a sublimation reaction for the chemists in the audience. And we produce um, a graphitic carbon as our byproduct. So we produce two products with almost no CO2 produced as part of the process. And I'll go on and talk about emissions in a little part, but we've actually really got a strong third product, which is abatement. And when we operate on biogas, our preferred feedstock, we're actually a carbon negative process. And we have had some external work done to, to audit our, our process against greenhouse gas accounting standards, both Australian and international. And we estimate that we'll get 100 to 150 tonnes of CO2 abatement credit for each tonne of hydrogen we produce. So not only can we offer a, a, a fleet, a low, um, a low carbon fuel, we can actually allow them to offset other emissions in their business by using hydrogen from this process. And we think that'll be a really valuable selling point into early adopter markets. So as well as technical innovation, you know, the technology was developed at the University of Western Australia. We have ongoing a research collaboration with the University of Sydney. But as well as sort of uh, innovation around the technology, the use of a cheap catalyst to produce two products without a waste, uh, we've also worked hard at understanding how the market's likely to be involved and what we'll do to be attractive in the market now in the next you know, three, five and ten years, you know, ahead of what's expected to be the very long-term growth of large export chains in 2030 and beyond. And we've identified that our process is remarkably well suited to being used on biogas or biomethane. So that's uh, methane which originates from breaking down organic waste. And there's two primary sources of that, landfill and wastewater treatment plants. And so we've identified that what we actually offer is a really sort of uh, really nice piece of smart city sustainable infrastructure as well as low emission hydrogen and transport fuel. Because when we looked at where landfill and wastewater treatment plants were in almost any developed city, and this model applies not just to the Australian cities, um, but also in Asia, US, uh, Europe, 
but you typically find that the days of every council having a small dump down the back of the creek um, are sort of well gone. All right. Okay. And so now what we're seeing is we're seeing a cluster of large biogas sources on the outskirts close to where transport fleets and others work. So we see an opportunity to do um, a waste to resource project where we take biogas, we turn it into fuel, the fuel goes back to support the same waste fleets or the same bus fleets that are servicing the population that creates that waste. Um, I've mentioned emissions. I'll quickly talk about the graphite. So we make a graphite byproduct. Um, it is a unique product. It's a unique synthetic graphite that comes in three distinct shapes: carbon nanotubes, carbon nano onions, and carbon microshells. Um, we think that it has potential in lithium-ion batteries, lubricants, activated carbons, carbon black, and advanced materials such as concrete composites and building composites. Um, we've currently, through our second pilot plant with Mineral Resources, achieved 97% purity graphite. Um, and we're currently pursuing a research program to understand how we purify that to you know four nines or five nines as needed. Um, we've currently got eleven material transfer agreements out with various companies looking to um, uh, identify new products and new markets based on the graphite. So where we are now with the technology, and I'll get to some specifics about the company outlook. So. We've been through a process of significant technical development over the last five years, starting with primary research and bench scale testing, then two years of intense piloting. These are our pilot plants uh, in Quinana, south of Perth. The green pilot plant is owned by Hazer and is a fluidised bed. Uh, the back pilot plant is owned by Mineral Resources and is the mechanical paddle tube reactor. And so we've gone through an intense pilot process that has allowed us now to have the engineering capability and data necessary to design a fully operational commercial scale plant, sub, probably sub-economic in scale for the first one, but actually a fully operational integrated plant. Um, our focus uh, is very much on the development of that commercial demonstration project, the first uh, demonstration of the technology working in all its aspects. Um, we have really sort of three streams that are pursuing that. The first one actually is the commercial demonstration plant to be lo located at Woodman Point, south of Perth, under an MOU with the Water Corporation, the Perth-based water utility that supplies sewerage and drainage services to the City of Perth, and they'll provide us biogas and a source for the plant. In parallel to that, we're working with customers in Asia uh, to identify uh, sites where we can implement the Hazer technology in early adopter city markets, and that particularly has a strong focus in Japan. And we think there'll be customers that mature during the development process of the Hazer CDP. And our third stream is our collaboration with Mineral Resources on the development of a synthetic graphite project in WA. So we have a three-stage process with Mineral Resources, funded by Mineral Resources, to build a synthetic graphite plant using the Hazer technology under licence. And this year we completed phase one of that, which was the demonstration of the paddle tube reactor pilot plant. And the results of that are now being uh, studied by Mineral Resources to look to the scope, scale and timing of stage two. For our commercial demonstration plant, we're proposing to build a 100 tonne per annum hydrogen facility, which will produce about 380 tonnes per annum of graphite, and that's enough hydrogen to power about 10 buses. We're using waste gas as a feedstock um, to be taken from an existing biogas operation south of Perth. Uh, that's a photo of the existing digesters producing gas, and we're initially going to use gas which is currently being flared, so it's a great example and validation of that reuse of a waste uh, into a high value product, hydrogen and graphite. Uh, we're making really good progress on the project. Um, we have uh, term sheets for both the biogas supply and project collaboration uh, locked away with Water Corporation. We've appointed external engineers who are going through the detailed design phase now, which we anticipate to finish around November this year. We have an estimated capital cost of just under $16 million, and we're targeting financial close on that project by the end of the year. Uh, if we achieve those milestones, we expect to be up and running in January 2021 for an initial three-year phase. Uh, key development in the last couple of months, as well as the appointment of engineers and the development of the physical project, has been locking away the first part of our funding package, which was a $9.41 million grant from ARENA. Um, we're currently going through the process of closing out that funding agreement uh, and also making progress on um, the key conditions to that agreement, being the biogas supply and a hydrogen offtake agreement. If I look sort of one step further forward, so if the first commercial demonstration plant shows our technology fully operational, de-risks its, its operations and allows people to observe it at scale, 
We've also looked at what a larger plant may be. And we're looking at sort of plants anywhere from 1,000 to 2,500 tonnes per annum, enough to supply a couple of hundred buses or an early adopter market in a big city. Uh, we're seeing a lot of traction with this with uh, infrastructure planners in Asia in particular because it's a small enough plant that they can integrate it into their city plans uh, to meet early adopter markets without breaking the budget. And we think these will have very attractive economics for what is a piece of industrial infrastructure of, you know, somewhere in the uh, you know, mid to high teens to low 20s. I've mentioned the collaboration with Mineral Resources, that's ongoing and they've given us an enormous amount of support uh, and we've given them an enormous amount of support and we're currently sitting between stage one and stage two uh, on our collaboration agreement, uh, analysing the results of the pilot plant. As I mentioned, in achieving 97% graphite purity, it, it outperformed our design expectations uh, and we're really positive about the future of that as part of the, the technology. So we're a prop Proprietary technology with a strong IP protection. Uh, we've received two full Australian patents this year. We have two more in process and we have patent applications in 23 countries. Uh, we offer exposure to two high growth markets in hydrogen and graphite. Uh, we're a unique synthetic graphite and we see a lot of potential for creating proprietary products coming out of the back end of it. Um, the technology development process has been rigorous, supported by the large scale hydrogen industry and our ability to access a lot of well proven hydrogen engineering and gas engineering technology. And we now have a clear commercial demonstration path through the first project uh, with the Water Corporation and WA. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Jeff. And we've got time for a couple of questions. So please, there's one right at the back there. Thanks, Jeff. Um, could you just talk to any of the safety considerations at the production side and also the, the usage side? Sure. So this is a question which is you know, frequently asked, you know, concerns about hydrogen safety. Um, so hydrogen you know, is a gas which both burns and explodes. Um, that's sort of stating the obvious, but actually we've been managing that risk in LPG, in natural gas um, and in you know, liquid fuels for, for many years. Um, so I, I think that there's an important thing the industry has to do to create uh, social comfort, social license through you know, clear demonstration of appropriate standards, you know, good, regula good regulation, both self and external, and able to operate these uh, facilities safely. But the inherent risk in hydrogen is no more risky than running LPG or natural gas. Um, there's some arguments that says it can be less risky. So hydrogen has more tendency to leak because it's very, very um, small molecule. But actually, if you expose hydrogen to the atmosphere, it rises at somewhere over 80 metres per second because it's so light. So if it doesn't ignite almost instantaneously, it disperses very, very quickly. So there's actually no inherent technical or engineering risk that makes hydrogen more risky to handle than you know, unleaded petrol or natural gas. But we have to exhibit the same sort of skill and care in you know, designing equipment, setting up regulations and teaching people how to use it. You know, the same way when we did when we introduced natural gas to homes in the 80s. Okay. Yeah. Just interested in um, the site where you supply the for customers. So you're putting in a plant with the um, water corporation. There's potential to, for them to just take the hydrogen, reuse it, and then supply their own energy needs. Is that a market you've looked at in terms of maybe early adopters? where they're just using their own off-gas production for for energy and then you get the carbon? Yeah. Um, we have considered that. It's probably not the most economically efficient business model. So, you know, it's funny, you know, energy ain't energy if we paraphrase oils ain't oils. You know, so there's a lot of debate about gas prices at the moment where the wholesale gas price, I haven't looked at NEMWATCH today, but I'm guessing is about 8 or $9 a gigajoule. You know, we're buying diesel at $1.70 something today at the equivalent of $50 something dollars a gigajoule. So for early adoption, we probably think the transport market is the best one because you're targeting its highest value use. So therefore, any incentive or subsidy that's needed is at is its minimum, so we can build scale through that way. So long term, you certainly could see that market, but it's one of the lower value markets. Very, very high volume, very, very safe. So there's some elements about that that are commercially attractive, but we think it probably makes more sense to target the high value uses first, and then as you come down in price through economies of scale, you know, economies of efficiency and in infrastructure, you can move into those markets which demand a lower price position. Another question? In the middle. 
Hi, you mentioned about um, hydro cell uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. Is there a drop off in power output when you replace diesel with the hydro cells? Um, one's a gas. Is that you need more volume? Um, no, no drop off in power. So, you know, a hydrogen fuel cell bus, truck, um, car is essentially an electric vehicle. So it has all of the same performance characteristics and advantages uh, you know, um, as an electric vehicle. So, you know, for instance, Anglo American um, are promising to have a hydrogen fuel cell haul pack, you know, a big yellow truck for mines operating by the end of next year. So, you know, it has the benefit of being an electric drive. So it has enormous torque performance and, and power performance, acceleration performance. Um, you do have to store your hydrogen, and so your tank brings weight, but that's offset by not having you know, batteries, or a diesel tank itself has significant weight when you fill it with diesel. So uh, the performance of these vehicles are, are really quite remarkable, as you know, the performance of any of the new generation of electric vehicles are. Oh, look, it's, it's good. To see. Perhaps one more will squeeze it in. Just to add a, your slide on the global focus on hydrogen didn't mention China. Can you just tell us what they're doing? Or um, It's a really good point. So you know, the, a lot of the global focus on hydrogen has come through Japan, Europe and Korea, and they've all you know, collaborated in multinational regional studies. You know, they've published their roadmaps in Australian, Korean, Japanese, English. Um, China in its own quiet way isn't saying much but is doing a lot. But, you know, what I would anticipate, and this is purely my sort of, you know, look forward, is that hydrogen will appear more uh, visibly in their next five-year plan. Um, there's been some comments by the, uh, by President Xi this year, you know, saying hydrogen is part of the future. If I had to guess what's going on, you know, what we're seeing is that more hydrogen buses are being manufactured in China than the rest of the world put together, but they're only making them a couple of hundred at a time. So for them, it hasn't even got to a city trial where they might make them a thousand at a time. But in their usual way, even their trials are sort of five times the size of, of other markets. Um, so it's, it's certainly on their radar, uh, but it is not yet part, to the best of my knowledge, of a, a formal five-year plan. Uh, we've focused our sort of initial BD efforts on Australia and Japan, uh, where the the markets are probably more established, and we also think we have a bit more control over IP, and we have sort of long established engineering partnerships that are perhaps you know, built on long relationships of trust. Um, we're starting to see the interest from China, but it'll take some more investigation from us to understand it as a market.